Zara Desai here for you. He's going to talk about Open Canary. It's really exciting. It only was released a month ago, I think you said. Yeah, just over a month ago. So it's going to be very cool. Um, so kick us off. Thanks, Tabar. So I know the last talk mentioned uh, security, but when the slides come up, we'll have another talk about, we'll turn our attention to security, but of the computer variety. Uh, let's just find out where the slide has gone. So now that we're done fiddling with the, uh, with the various uh, dual monitor setup, uh, let's turn our attention to a security problem. So as an in introduction, I work at a uh, applied computer security firm called Thinkst. Um, we really enjoy our computer security, and we like to aim at problems that others tend to avoid. So although we're a small company based out of South Africa, um, the code you write is deployed at uh, several companies that many of us use every day. Um, and I must mention, though, that the work in this talk is not done by me alone. Uh, there's a team of us, and the others are vastly more impressive than myself. Uh, they've been doing talks, writing papers, giving trainings across the world in this area uh, long before I ever wrote my first Hello World in Python. So the plan for today is to, I just want to give a brief overview of the way people use Python in the computer security community. It's not very different to the way anyone else uses it, but just in case there's a few uh, niche stuff that, that people may not be aware of. And then we'll talk about the actual subject of the talk, which is honeypots, the thinking that led us there to this, to this thing, and then onto Open Canary. And then finally, what I'd like to do is just finish off with uh, some interesting sort of day-to-day -day problems that we hit our heads up again uh, during the working and stuff. And the main reason I want to do that is I want to show how Python shows uh, plays a big role in that. Uh, just because we're at PyCon and there's very few places where you can get up and, you know, sort of sing an ode to Python, may as well make it this one. So in the security community, uh, Python is almost a de facto language, the go-to language that people uh, use. I mean, it's used all over because precisely because it has such great standard library to write libraries, tools, frameworks, and of course, very usefully as a plugin language. Um, some of the the more useful things is, so for example, in the, the debugger IDA and GDB even, um, it's easily extensible using Python and it's indispensable for reverse engineers and, and exploit developers. But one really cool framework that I don't think many people may have heard of, has anyone heard of Innuendo? Uh, okay, Innu so Innuendo is really cool. It's a framework for writing implants or malware developed by a company called ImmunitySec. And the really interesting thing about it is the you can write your implant in malware and extend it using Python. Um, it's quite remarkable just given the fact that um, the malware is very sort of flexible um, and it can do things like execute within a completely legitimate process. So I just thought it was quite a, it's quite a, it's a very nice example of Python well used. Um, at Thinkst, so we like Python for many of the same reasons that you do and we have several active projects going on it. But the one reason that I've really, really come to appreciate uh, about using Python is just that it's really, for those really times, those, those really pressing times where you quickly need to experiment and test that idea to see if something works out. Um, that's something I really appreciate Python for. And towards the end, I'll, I'll show how that, that works out. But for now, uh, let's turn our attention towards honeypots. So honeypots are clearly a very old idea. And if the published record is anything to go by, um, this idea has, the sign for this idea has certainly passed. I mean, it's, it's quite outdated. And people don't really give it much serious thought in most quarters. But back in the heyday, in the early 1990s, there were a few papers that sort of capitalized uh, honeypots into sort of general attention and that sparked interest in them. Um, there's one paper that I have to mention, just from 1991 at uh, AT&T at Labs. The guy called Bill Cheswick um, wrote a paper called An Evening with Burford. It's called An Evening in which a cracker is lured, endured, and studied. It's a bit of a silly title, but I assume it would have been appropriate for the early 90s. But uh, what he did was he just described his, his approach to setting up a sort of fake vulnerable mail server in order to watch some random person on the internet attempt to exploit his mail server and, and sort of try to gain further access to more computers, but all within a jailed honeypot. Uh, but there's one observation he makes during this paper that has aged very well over the past decade. He just says, A, setting up this honeypot took a lot of work, and B, he wasn't really sure whether it was worth it because um, he wasn't really sure whether they got much out of it. So over the next decade, 
the honey pot research continued in that line. And so by the early 2000s, early 2000s the HoneyNet project was established. I think some of you will have heard of the HoneyNet project, especially some of the security guys in the back. Um, and the key, one of the key aims of the HoneyNet project was to say, okay, we're developing honeypots and we're using these to study attacker techniques, tools, and well, their motives as well, and then sharing that with people. So, so far, by the early 2000s, things are going well for honeypots and, the st and stars on the rise. But then this is where things start to go down. And I really like this diagram because it really is such a great summary of the history of honeypots to date. So this is the summary of activity on the honey net, on one of the honey major honeypot mailing list. And it definitely peaks early 2000, and then there's a long decline to nothing today. So it's, it's, this long, it's in this long tail of decline that I just want to quickly turn to and speculate as to why did they stumble? I mean, these honey net guys and everyone else was, was quite, quite enthusiastic about what they could learn from them. So I don't want to go into too much detail uh, about this. If you're more interested, we can chat later afterwards. But the one reason I do want to focus on is that I'd argue quite strongly that honeypots were pitched with the completely wrong criteria. So remember I mentioned the HoneyNet project emphasized that they wanted to study uh, attack techniques. So, I mean, it is an interesting use at the time. We didn't know that much in the early 90s. Uh, and, but it's still a limited way to think of honeypots. But uh, further on, uh, honeypots started earning quite a bad reputation as not living up to this ability. And we think there's something missing. So even if the honeypots fall by the wayside, there's still a problem that remains unaddressed, right? Even if we don't have honeypots on a network, we still really want to know when something bad happens on a network. And it's clearly a problem that we're really bad at today. So nowadays, in order to keep up with security news, I realize that I no longer have to follow specialist uh, news sites. I can just read the New York Times and follow the headlines, and then I'll, then I'll have heard about the target breach, where they stole a whole lot of credit card details, uh, the OPM breach in one of the US government departments, the NSA's breach of Belgacom, the Belgian Telecom, and of course, everyone's favorite, the Ashley Madison breach. Um, the one thing that these breaches have in common is that there's a lengthy period, sometimes often as long as a few months, where we have other people that shouldn't be there lurking on someone's internal network and seeing what they can find, scraping up as much data as possible, and then exfiltrating it back home or wherever else they want to take it to. Um, so it's a healthy assumption in general that somewhere in a large network, it's inevitable that a breach will occur. But what this Honeybot history was suggesting to us, and the, or in combination with this problem that we we're thinking of, is why does that internal lurking have to go unnoticed? Uh, because surely there's a, long a lo there's a long window period of activity happening, and there's a lot of things going on. So this is where we think Honeypots can be refocused to tackle. And this is precisely the use case I want to focus on. So I refer to this as the canary use case. Uh, canary as in canary in the coal mine. Um, and what we like to do is use honeypots to flag when something definitively bad happens on a network. So something that we know is a very strong signal of something going wrong. And this is in contrast to uh, sensors or, or sensors of many sort which report normal and bad traffic and then attempt to distinguish between the two or try and figure out what malicious traffic looks like or continually learn and update what they look like. Um, so, for short, I'll often refer to this type of honeypot just as canary uh, interchangeably in the rest of the talk. But be before I leave this, this general topic of the actual use case of honeypots as a canary, I just want to mention that um, honeypots are not the only ways you can do this, right? Um, this is also an old idea of using something that gives you an indication where something incontrovertibly bad has happened. So, some companies embed fake canary credit card numbers in their, real in their real credit card databases so that if they see the fake credit card number pop up on the internet or on a carding forum somewhere, then they'll know something has gone wrong. Someone has seen that database. But I mean, you can also imagine extending that idea to, say, Word documents or PDF documents. Imagine exploring the way we can detect if uh, a document has been stolen and it's suddenly now been opened somewhere on a computer connected to the internet. So incidentally, we have another project that explores that area that's called Canary Tokens. But for today in this talk, we'll just want to focus on the honeypot use case. So the honeypot that we've been developing is one called Open Canary. So we just released it last month at a security conference called Black Hat. 
and it's a BSD license honeypot focused on exactly this use case, alerting on incontrovertibly bad actions. So just to give you a rough overview, you have several open canary daemons running, and uh, these daemons all have a particular sort of fake protocols emulated, and if they chip, then they'll send an alert, and those alerts are sent to a central correlator, and you'll get an alert. So the honeypot daemons are basically twisted-based, and it's almost pure Python. Um, I say almost pure Python with a little bit of uh, regret because Python was really great and it got us very far very quickly. So Twisted, for example, is a major boon in getting a lot of this stuff up quickly. But there's some problems where there just weren't the tools to help us and we didn't want to go that route. So for example, one of the things we needed was a full Samba implementation so we could have Canary Honeypot join uh, active directory domains, uh, which is what you'd expect in a typical corporate network. Uh, and there wasn't a Python option. And I'll mention later on that uh, in a, I'll mention later on that there's a commercial version that we worked with, and in that we needed to mangle IP packets, and for that we erred away from Python and went instead with a kernel module. So as an overview, roughly that is what it looked like. So you'll have some sort of network, canaries will be scattered throughout an internal network, they'll report these events to the, a correlator, and the important thing is that every single event that a single canary reports is meant to be one that an action should be taken on. There's definitely something going wrong. So in case one of your open canary one of your canary demons runs an SSH server, if there's a login on the SSH server, then that generates alert and we hope you'd pay attention to that. So if and if there's a brute force of that SSH server, then the correlator will just roll up the events into one alert. But importantly, there's one important distinction to make here, which is not often seen in other more traditional honeypot, is that this is not intended to be run uh, as an on an internet facing computer because um, I think you all know when you just put a server out there on the internet, it's just, there's just going to be people SSH, SSH brute forcing, and it doesn't really mean much. Uh, but on an internal network, that's a much stronger signal of something going wrong. And an even stronger signal is, is, is if you prepared your honeypot to recognize public keys of maybe your important uh, people within your organization. If, and someone's trying to use that key, then you're like, uh oh, maybe that key has been stolen and it's not been, using, not been used on an SSH. So I just want to give a really brief demo of a just of a quick setup and hopefully the hopefully we'll be allowed to get back into that but since we know so which machine is this okay so I've already set it up and installed it in a virtual end so and I've already configured one so what I'll just do is start an instance of it uh, the password is user if anyone's interested um, it will, so it's just the demons are in the background. So now let's just say on the other machine, someone's browsing on that particular network. Someone must speak the notes. Ah, oh, here we go. So I've color coded in a cheesy way. So let's say someone has discovered that there's a computer canary out there, right? And then they decide, oh, well, let me just see what's running on that canary. So I've used the SV flag within my program. It just means that so it does the normal sort of port scan, check which port's open, but also goes a little bit further and probes the services to figure out what versions things, what versions of services are running. So in this case, the open canary is running Samba and MySQL. And Within the, for example, within the open canary config, you can modify that exactly what shows up in that Ubuntu thing. Um, I was trying to, I was arguing that I was <laughs> considering showing an, a random message in there, but I was advised that it's unclear to mess with it, rather just show a default banner so that it's clear. But the important thing that happens is the alert will get sent, and unfortunately my phone has been on silent. So I'll just leave that running. The alert should come through. If it doesn't, then I'll have it. I have a little bit of network troubles. But let's carry on from there. So within Open Canary, there's not just Samba and uh, MySQL. We've implemented a whole slew of protocols. And the aim of emulating these protocols is that we want to alert early on in the protocols. In, in the protocol, and 
as early as possible so that, we've, that we know that something has gone wrong. So often we don't have to emulate the full protocol. So our motivation in choosing some of the modules is that we try to choose modules that will get in the way of a typical attacker. So some of the people on our team have been doing pen testing for, for many, many years. And they have these sort of favored habits that they go to as easy as um, when they break into a network just to see, just to you know, do what they need to do. And what we like to do is aim some of these services to be in a way that if someone is in a network, they'll need to look at stuff. So like one thing people don't often think about is an HTTP proxy. So sometimes when you've uh, first reached a network, you're sitting on the box, and now you need internet access from that box. But um, your computer can't directly link out. It needs to go via a proxy, which is not very really uncommon in, 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 a, in a corporate setup. So you could just do a quick port scan for a whole lot of HTTP proxies, try and find an open one, and then use that. So if there's... Um, if they hit a can if a canary demon's running an HTTP proxy, they'll hit that, and then when they try login, an alert will be sent, so you'll know there'll be something to look at. Um, so, but at this point, adding modules uh, is quite forward. It's quite straightforward. So, I just want to take a look, for example, at the SIP module. So, it's slightly more of an unusual case, but we just thought that if someone's issuing SIP requests across the network, it's definitely something going wrong. So, it's a really quick, uh, it's really quick and short piece of code. That's the whole thing. And in part, it's due to Twisted handling a lot of it. And then Open Canary handles the alerts that, that happens at that log method. Uh, but some of the criticisms that we get when we propose the idea of using Honeypot is that, for one, the criticism that people often bring up is that, OK, well, surely we can fingerprint the honeypots, Honeypot. So um, I don't want to get into too much details, but for the fingerprinting question, the one thing we are trying to do is turn the tables a bit. Often people, people refer to the attacker having a better game in that the defender has to make one mistake, the attacker has to win once, get a reach, and things work out in their favor. What we'd like to do here is turn the tables in some sense. So you're, um, if you have a whole lot of demons scattered out, the person lurking around your network has to make one mistake in order to set off an alert, or one mistake in not properly fingerprinting it correctly before actually deciding, great, ignore that, that's going to trigger an alert. And the second thing we do is we can also fingerprint on alerts a lot, of a, a lot of fingerprinting is actually very, very distinctive. So I'll mention a case of that a bit later. The one thing that I think uh, will, will probably cross most of, uh, most of your minds if people work in open source software is, OK, well, look, a lot of these other honeypots have fallen into, have frozen into disuse. So many of these honeypot projects are unfortunately no longer left standing. Um, so for Open Canary, we actually have uh, quite a nice arrangement in that we have a commercial version running alongside so the two projects can support each other. And it's been mutually beneficial in both ways. In, the ones, in one way, we have um, fixes we're doing from one get put into other. And thanks to some cool contributions from the community, we've been actually learning some nice stuff from what other people want to do with it. So. Things Canary is just effectively Open Canary pre-installed on a little box with a very e easy UI for setting it up, and you can manage all, a whole host of them on a web console. So just to give you some idea of where we've gone with uh, this Canary subject in general, uh, of the deployments that we've done with Canary, we've managed to spread uh, a fair way across the way way across the globe so far. Um, so I only mentioned this in part because for us it was an initial validation of the idea, the fact that we could deploy the same idea and have it working for companies or organizations from Silicon Valley all the way into the Middle East. Um, so for us that was, was quite a validation of, of the idea. But the main reason I mentioned this is just to say, as always, with a little Python and a little elbow, elbow grease, we can really push tech out there. And thanks, by the way, we're a big fan of locally produced tech being used worldwide, tested out there. It's, um, yeah, we really like seeing that happening. We know that some of you guys doing some really cool stuff, and that's it's generally quite pleasing. So in the beginning of the talk, I mentioned I just want to chat about uh, how Python helped us get to where we are. So to do that, I want to take you on a little day-to-day -day tour of some of the little problem-solving things that we ran into uh, while building this stuff. So I'll just touch on three recent episodes where Python was pretty useful. So I mentioned earlier that we were marking up a whole lot of protocols, and one of the ones we wanted to do was Microsoft SQL Server. When you're emulating, it's, it's things people, quite, people want to see on a network. Uh, and the part we're most interested about 
implement about this protocol is just the authentication, the login. Because someone's trying to log into your database, and it's a completely fake database that no one should be using anyway. Clearly, something's gone wrong. Normally, I'd approach a problem like this by setting up a, setting up a, you know, a default uh, MySQL server, setting up a client, and then watch the traffic on the wire. And then, for good measure, I also consulted the documentation. So this is what MSDN told me I was going to see on the wire. But that didn't quite happen the way the docs promised me. What actually happened was the initial setup message goes through. I'm a MySQL client. And there was a little flag that said something, something, encryption, something, something. I can't remember the exact phrase, but it's that something to do with encryption. And I wasn't really sure how the flag was being used, but there was a flag and it was set. And the server sends another, uh, the same, or, well, it's its own init message back, uh, also that same flag. And But I mean, up to now, the protocol's fine. I mean, we can easily fake this message. We know exactly what it looks like. But the problem here is we couldn't see the rest of the protocol because the connection was automatically upgraded, opportunistically upgraded. Uh, to an encrypted one. So we had uh, several options at this point. One would have involved pouring over the MSDN documentation and, and trying to get a much more deeper understanding of the, of the protocol. But we're looking for a quicker way to figure out just the authentication part. And this way, Python, like the superhero it is, came to the rescue, in fact, with Twisted. So it turns out it just took about 10 minutes later, and we had a TCP, TCP proxy written in Python. And all it did was pass the traffic through and look for this particular particular byte string and flip that single bit from the client, flip the single bit from back on the server, and everything else continues on pass, and we could see the rest of the protocol and continue to mark it up. So just to give you a sense of how easy it was, uh, that's the one half of the protocol. Literally copy the data over, and if you see this thing we're looking for, just flip a bit in it. So it may sound a little bit more straightforward now because uh, I told you in the, in the beginning that that bit was the encryption bit and that's how it was using. But before we set up the problem, we weren't really sure how the bit was being used. And the great thing about being able to quickly mock it up was that if we were wrong, then we wouldn't have wasted that much time. We could quickly go back and try another bit. One of the other things we wanted to do this time in the commercial uh, Canary version was spooling Nmap. So I know we've mentioned Nmap already, but for those of you who don't are not aware, Nmap is this all-star sports scanner. It's it's the it's the heavyweight sports scanner, but it also does a lot of other things. Uh, one of the other things it does is it can fingerprint an OS based on the peculiarities in the network IP stack, right? So uh, amidst uh, many TCP IP UDP standards, there's always little bits of corners where implementers can do things slightly differently. Um, and those are the sort of quirks that MF tries to pick up on to be able to distinguish uh, which OS is running on a host. So how NMAP's OS detection works is it sends the exact same 16 packets to any host, gets those replies, and then runs uh, roughly over 100 tests on those response, and then it has a pre-compiled database of test results that it can match up with OS, and it just has an algorithm for matching the closest match. So knowing that at this point uh, about the problem. We could go, oh, okay, well, the standard solution here is we write a kernel module or extend IP tables and we'll start playing with that. But it's quite a bit more time consuming to, to get to that point where you can hopefully start playing. So again, here's another place where Python comes to rescue, but central to this times, uh, this, this approach is a module called NFQ that exist on Linux for IP tables. I'm not sure, have anyone, has anyone used NFQ? Ah, great. Okay, so you guys are all pretty much familiar with it. Uh, but for those who aren't aware with it, it essentially just um, allows you to set up a rule where you tell the kernel, okay, this packet is coming in. Now, instead of using a rule in IP tables to determine where the uh, packet must go to, you say, okay, well, IP tables pass this packet to user space, and a program there will pick it up and will decide what to do with the packet and then will tell you and then you can carry on with the rest of your, be rest of your, rest of your work. Um, and it can even modify the packet, so that's, that's often quite, quite useful. Uh, the nifty thing about this is that, of course, the user space, if it's just a user space program, it can, it can be written in Python. So as a really nice thing, uh, a very easy thing to do is if you just want to quickly pick up those packets that I just sent through with that last, with this particular IP type table zoo, if you want to pick it up in Python, you can literally do it in, I don't know how many lines that is, but that looks like very, very little 
very little lines. So what I think just what this code is just doing is saying, okay, well, if I get a ping packet, so this INC, INC, ICMP echo request, uh, it's just saying, okay, well, just drop that packet and everything else passes to find. But since we're playing with Nmap here, right, we don't just want to figure out which, which packets Nmap is sending to us. Now we know how we can test for the various features of Nmap packet. We also need to send reply. But uh, I don't know if you noticed in the previous slide, in this slide, we're using Scappy, which is also a wonderful packet manipulation tool that uh, a lot of security people use. It's just their go-to thing when they need to flip bits in packets. And again, a very quick little addition, and we're sending ICMP packet replies back. And the cool thing is that we can just change every, anything we want about the packet, including the payload, all sorts of random details one would never, uh, one's not, often not interested in. So in the end, we didn't actually go with this method, but it was just useful for playing around, getting a sense of a problem. In the end, we actually had to go with the kernel module because it was a better fit uh, with some other constraints we had. But the last problem that I want to mention is that came up with the Canary is something called DNS tunneling. So one of the things you encounter on many big networks is that if you deploy a device and you try to connect out to whatever server you set up and you say, okay, you asked, you asked the canary to connect to, I don't know, initially we thought we could just open a TCP connection out to the internet and then maybe send syslog messages or something to uh, our log server. But we quickly realized that so many networks by default are not going to allow you to randomly do that. And the administrative hassle of getting someone to open a port for you in a very large organization can be incredibly time consuming and painful. But all hope is not lost. So often in a lot of these network setups, it's still possible to use DNS, right? I mean, you can't, um, I assume some of you are familiar with the subject, but I mean, you can't, um, you can't make a direct connection out, but you can do a DNS query and you do the query, and then at some point, so in this case, our thing's name server will know, okay, someone somewhere looked up. I'm covering a little bit of details. We'll come to that. But somewhere, someone looked up this particular query, and we know they, they looked at that query. So we can really extend this idea a bit and say, okay, well, why don't we set up our own special domain with our own special name server, and we ask the, query, the canary to do a query like this, host.myfirstmessage.canary.tools. So now... When, the, when our name server, especially set up, gets this query, it's like, oh, okay, someone sent, someone tried to look up an address, and the subdomain they sent through was my first message, and now the server knows the message. So now we have a way to get information out of the network to our uh, correlator. Does anyone have any ideas, by the way, or a guess of how we can get information back in? Oh, someone's nodding. What are you going to say? TXT, exactly. Okay. So for those of you not familiar, instead of, oh, actually, let me, let, let me do the build up since you guys have beaten me to the actual solution itself. So, I mean, you could try something like encoding your message in an IP address. And if that's too small, maybe you could switch to IPv6 and then you have a little bit more space. But that's still quite painful. Luckily, there's other types of records called TXT records. And what it is, is you look up the record, you get back a text description. So... Now we have um, information going in and out. So to tie that together, how the canary can now, can now communicate out of the network is it can do a text record lookup, and the message will be encoded in the subdomain, and data will come back uh, in the value as the text record. But there's, so I mentioned earlier that I was glossing over a whole lot of details. Um, and the most important detail that I'm glossing over is the fact that DNS is A, connectionless, and quite unreliable. So there are a few problems to solve. So I just want to quickly, I know the slide's a little bit heavy, but I'll just quickly run through that uh, just to give you a sense of what it takes to finish the problem off to get it into a production state where it works out there in the real world. So firstly, people won't be very happy if you're sending a uh, network originating from the data originating from the network out in the clear text onto the whole internet. You'd probably get kicked out of on first suggesting it. So the simple solution is do some sort of encryption. So we use NACL. Um, and then the next problem you run into, of course, is that um, you can only use a certain amount of characters, a certain type of characters in the DNS query. So net case insensitive letters and numbers and a hyphen. So you'll need to do some sort of encoding. 
we use the base 3 tree encoding with a slight, slight modification. But I mean, you can always invent your own custom encoding that's a lot more efficient um, if, you need, if you need to. The other problem that also comes up is that because of DNS caching, if you issue the same, if your canary does the same request twice, somewhere along the line in the chain of DNS servers that are queried to look up this answer, somewhere one in the middle is going to say, oh, I've seen this query before. We don't need to go check the actual name server. Yeah, I'll just send you the old copy. So we get around this by in two ways. The main thing is just, hey, you append random data. So there's a very, very, very slim chance you'll ever send the same DNS query again, even if you're sending the exact same message. So you just use some random padding. And another thing that just, just to be on the safe side, to lower the probability of it ever happening, you could also just lower the TTL on the DNS record so that they won't cache it for very long. Um, and the other four simple problems is limited size of the domain range. You can just chunk your message into several queries. And for repeated queries, that sometimes happens. So you just need to add packet IDs so that your thing receiving the queries knows, OK, I've seen this packet before. We can safely ignore it. So if all of this day-to-day -day stuff sounds fun, um, this is the kind of fun we had working on this. So if this sounds interesting, you're welcome to come join in and play, play with it. Open Canary is BSD licensed, so you can do pretty much whatever you want to do with it um, and test deployment on live networks. We'd love for you to try it out. Send code and criticisms. I've been learning a lot from some of the code contributions that have come in, so that's been pretty cool. So some parting thoughts. If you're keen, uh, do jump in. If you want to explore those other canary options that I mentioned that are not honeypots, but other things that alert on incontrovertibly bad actions, you can take a look at our other project called Canary Tokens. And the last point I want to mention is that um, I just talked about one very, very, very specific uh, security problem here, but there is lots of great room open to build and break better security. People are doing a lot more exciting things than those old school antiviruses and firewalls and really boring stuff. And since you're in this audience, you're very well equipped to be tackling those. So look out for contributions you can make. I'm sure you'll have cool stuff to do. And that brings me to the end. Thanks, guys. This is just a thought you said. Append, you were appending random data so you didn't have the same query twice in a row. Instead of random data, why not append a timestamp? Then you, because random data can be the same twice in a row, a timestamp is guaranteed not to. That's, that's actually a good idea. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. That's quite a good suggestion. Thanks. So I did see you mentioned Kippo there, um, yep. and I'm guessing that you've probably dealt with the Kippo upgrade problem at some point. Yeah. You kind of glossed over your own, but what about an upgrade thing there? Oh, yeah, yeah. You, How are you guys planning so, on dealing with um, that? The, because our solution is actually it's really quite a small problem. Um, the thing's is pretty installable, so you just pip install, use your usual But your database upgrade. of things, do you keep anything local, like the... Like the uh, Kippo artifact store, or anything like that. Uh, how do um, you deal with that kind so of thing? So on the Canary daemon side, it's just the daemon and a config file. You can update the config file as you want. Um, the correlator is separate, uh, but we're not so sure whether people in the community want to use that correlator or not. If they do, that's great. But you can also hook the, the daemon up to whatever other device you're using. So someone last week just pushed through some code for hooking it up to um, this other Honeypot infrastructure called H. P feeds, I think that's that's the name. Um, so you don't even have to use that. In that case, you'll just have one daemon, and your only state will be the config file. So that all that's all they used to update. In the and then just one last question: the um, on the DNS, I see you've got no forward error correction or anything else on responses. So if you want to, uh, you know, chunk a message over multiple requests, yeah. or on the response side, the receiving side, a, a retry mechanism, anything. Oh, yeah. Do you have a low enough so message yeah, yeah. volume that you don't need yeah. that? So we have a no, no. We have we definitely have a retry mechanism, um, especially since sometimes if you're going to have a brute force. Um, so so far we've been handling brute force actually surprisingly quite nicely. So we've had someone against our good advice had deployed uh, one of these devices on the public internet and it was getting hit with an SSH typical sort of SSH brute force and it was holding up quite well. Um, what happens then is we have well, we have a we have a retry queue. So um, if it does get hold it, it'll. Um, so, 
to be honest, there's a few devices that I'm not actually sure where they are. Um, I know they're reporting in, so there could be some in the region, but no, we haven't uh, done that. It's not intentional, no. Um, if you're from that area and <laughs> would like to try it out, be my guess. Um, I just uh, comment, uh, there is one honeypot project that still works, but on a very limited scale, it looks for email spammers and actually gets the law involved, and that's a sister company of Cloudflare called Project Honeypot. Um, so that's one that's still working. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah no, no, no. There are definitely some that are yeah, 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 I don't yeah, mean to yeah, disparage the whole yeah, thing. Yeah. I just but, mean to say that it's taking a very slightly limited. different direction. It's just looking for email spammers. Um, but yeah, that looks like an interesting tool you've got there. Any other questions? Um, yeah, I was just wondering what uh, sort of information you're transmitting over that DNS interface because, you know, a lot of companies might not be happy with you having this kind of black box inside their network that you can then, <laughs> you know, communicate with. Um, sure, so but I mean, um, it's eggs. So you mentioned this problem, right, but a lot of companies will run something like um, those third-party mail server scanners. So, um, so I, I just want to mention a brief anecdote, uh, just to, to say, just to give it into this. Some people are actually surprisingly comfortable um, with the idea. And in this case, we're only sending, well, we're sending data that uh, could be suspicious. Though you're saying that we could be sending more data about the network out than is absolutely necessary. Yeah. So, um, for one, they can check out the Open Canary source code, uh, but they probably are also running other things that can send data out the network. So. Companies that run third-party email scanners. Um, if you've ever run, if you've ever embedded those, uh, if you ever run phishing campaigns and you've embedded links in those emails, you can often run. If you run a phishing campaign against a company that runs a typical third-party mail server, you'll quickly find that there'll be a whole lot of hits before someone has even seen the mail. So you'll see hits all over the world. I remember looking at one case where, when we were doing for a service we run. Um, I I was trying to debug why this client had so many hits on a particular email campaign when they just sent one email campaign and it wasn't open. And like the hits were bizarre. It was hits in um, several places in the Middle East, in Germany, in Moscow. I, like, I can't possibly imagine a person being in all these places and, and reading their email. So it turns out the answer in that case was um, their third party mail scanner and potentially it was passing it on to their partners for analysis. But yeah, in some, there's some measure of trust that has to take place, uh, but they can view. Uh, the code. Just to follow up on that, what are you actually sending in and out? Oh, okay. So <laughs> that's a good question. So we only send, um, so let's just, the typical example is we send information about that particular event. So we'd send, so if it's an SSH login, it'll be the public key of the login, username, password, source IP address, source port, destination port, time, um, the type of the event, and that sort of thing. That's, I think I'm pretty much covered, pretty, pretty much part of the meat of it. Um, there's not, there's not stuff like listen on your Intel network and send everything out. No, no, it's just the actual events. Hi, uh, uh, sorry, I was just wondering oh, uh, if you had any techniques that you use to try make these hosts seem really attractive to attack. Just to make the honeypot seem really attractive. Yeah. Um, so the one thing that we do is, well, this. the one thing is, we, one thing we do do is when we join an Active, di active Directory domain, if someone is enumerating all the machines, that could be a way to be discovered. So we are actively exploring more ways to make them discoverable. Uh, for the moment, that's the most uh, interesting one we have. The rest will rely on someone just doing a typical network-wide port scan and picking up, picking up the service uh, the way they usually would. Which is, which is a bit noisy, uh, but you're right, we do think we need to work on ways of making it more discoverable. Uh, you said in your plugins, uh, or modules as you call them, that you try to catch it as early in the sequence as possible. 
So I, I was interested by SIP, but it seems like you've got a very, very basic SIP handler there, yeah. actually. So it is quite a basic uh, handler. So for the SIP one, we're just saying, in this case, any SIP requests to this blatantly fast unused device should okay. be treated with suspicion. So something like TFTP, where you might sometimes yeah. have a writable TFTP server or uh, like a web dev that you can upload to, those kind so of things. Do you emulate to that extent? So with the TFT thing, um, again, with the TFT, we, we consider it in a similar class as the SIP um, in just that any activity on that um, is not considered useful. But the, the sorry, one, one point I should mention that's very different is something like Samba, for example. We don't consider browsing the file share to be a, an event because I'm sure, I'm sure you've seen many cases where you accidentally okay, so. discover the thing. So in that case, we consider pulling files to be an event. Okay, so you've got a kind of a degree of scope on which yeah. you'll evaluate. Okay. Yeah. If you have ideas on ones that should be changed, if you think some alerts aren't strong enough, I'd be interested to hear. Cool. Well, thank you, Azad. It was very, very interesting.